Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is now episode number 609. My name is Camden Busey. I'm recording from Grays Lake, Illinois, the Reformed Forum studio. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be with some friends. Let me introduce to you first, we have Jim Cassidy, who serves as the pastor of South Austin OPC down in South Austin, Texas. Welcome back, Jim. It's great to speak with you. As always, good to be here, Camden. Yeah, we like having you. And uh, for now, I think you got things set up through the end of the year with a place to meet, but has there any, been any progress with uh, with your church? Can people pray for you? Because I know there have been some issues with the city council and whatnot, and uh, they're kicking you out. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Uh, we do have to the end of the year for which we're grateful. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have our eye on a public school that we might be able to use in the interim. Uh, but the more exciting news, uh, perhaps for everyone to pray about, we can't give the details or the particulars, but there is a building, a church building that has come on our radar. And uh, we are we are angling to uh, to see whether or not we can purchase it. So um, we are currently raising funds and uh, putting some money in the bank so as to be able to put a down payment on that. And uh, we're, we're very excited about it, but we still need some things to be put in place before we can pull the trigger on that. But uh, we do appreciate your prayers and the concerns of God's people um, in order that uh, hopefully in 2020, maybe we'll be able to get into our own place. So mm-hmm. we'll see. Very good. Well, we'll we'll indeed think of you and pray for you in that regard, and uh, certainly the Lord will work something out, uh, which will be for your good. Uh, so we look forward to seeing how that how that unfolds. But we also want to introduce our guest today. We're very happy. I'm ecstatic, really, if you can't see, uh, to have our guest with us. Uh, it's been a little while, but we always love having uh, Dr. Daryl Hart. Uh, Daryl Hart uh, teaches uh, history at Hillsdale College out in Hillsdale, Michigan, the great state of Michigan. Welcome back, Daryl. It's good to speak with you. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. It's a little odd doing it with a uh, actual, what what do they call it, a video blog or, or a, a vlog because we have this <laughs> video stuff. Anyway. I feel like I've gone into the realm of blocking heads TV. Right. Uh, right. Well, yeah. Which is great. Mm-hmm. I I've seen some of those and I, I enjoy those 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 footage where you get some of those guys on there. I forget I, I think it is that website. Uh, there there are several, I think, where they have these people on and they do these kinds of things and just debate each other about whatever is going on. It's kind right. of right. part of the alt alt net. I wouldn't say alt right or alt left because there are many varieties, but the it's not the dark net either because it's not illicit or weird. Uh, it's weird, but uh, people talking about things that traditional media don't typically address. So I don't know if we'll we'll venture into those areas, but today we hope to be speaking about uh, Christianity and liberalism uh, by none other than J. Gresham Machen. And uh, there's a new edition of this book, which is available from Westminster Seminary Press. We're very thankful to them uh, for sending me a review copy. I've got the paperback here. There's also a hardcover edition, which I I, I take it, I don't have one, but I take it, given the, the design and the look of this, it's that it's a, a companion volume and printed very and bound very similarly to the John Murray Sermons volume. So this is a, what they call a legacy edition. So it not only has the, the full text of Machen's work, but also includes new essays by the faculty of Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, the current faculty on a whole host of issues. And uh, you can find essays in there by uh, folks, obviously, like uh, Sandy Finlayson, by our friends uh, Lane Tipton, Carlton Wynn, uh, uh, President Lilback has a piece. The whole faculty has got a piece in there, and you can check that out, uh, which is available now from wherever books are sold, especially WTSbooks.com. And uh, I assume uh, they're going to probably have one of the best deals on it for you. Oh, but it, it was another opportunity if we're going to talk Machen. You know, certainly we could have our friend Daryl on. Daryl's written a ton on Machen is uh, one of, if not the, I would just say he is the uh, foremost authority on, on J. Gresham Machen. And it is Gresham. <laughs> That's a little bit of an OPC shibboleth. Uh, but uh, we're delighted to speak about uh, Machen today and particularly the historical context of this book. Real quick, a couple things to mention before we get started on that subject. Uh, just our, our theology conference is coming up October 12th, 2019, and you can register for that at reformedforum.org slash conference. So we encourage you to get, head on over there. The early bird rate is still in effect until August 31st, or at least through August 31st. 
And uh, if you head on over, you can you can get in and um, come. And we're going to be discussing uh, Romans seven fourteen and the theme of the law is spiritual. So it gets into a lot of issues on the law and spirit as redemptive historical eras. Really gets into a lot of issues that Machen addresses in his notes on Galatians, which is a tremendous book. If you don't have it, try to dig up a copy there. Um, and so if you're interested in that sort of thing, we'd love to see you. We'd love to visit with you. So head on over to uh, reformedforum.org slash conference. And if you can, come visit us in Grays Lake, Illinois, October 12th. We look forward to seeing you. Well, Daryl, uh, thanks again for coming and um, looking forward to talking. We've we've had s- several conversations on Machen in the past here on the program, of course. And so no doubt we'll we'll cover some of that material again, but uh, I, I'll try to put links in the episode description to our previous conversations. Nevertheless, you know, it's still probably, how much late? 12 years? I think I've met you 12 years ago. And right. I think we started doing the program 11 years ago, 11 and a half. So one of those early ones back in my apartment, I think you you were on as a guest. I think we had you and, and Ann over for dinner, had a good time. Um, maybe maybe I had a good time. Maybe you didn't. No, whenever, whenever I have a dinner, um, that's that's a good time. But uh, I think we also, I think you also were on a program with Gary Johnson or something like that. I think that I think somebody, I think he ripped ripped on Machen a little bit. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> So I'll send people off on a wild goose chase to dig up on why 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 he may have caused offense somehow. I don't remember. But today we're going to be speaking about Christianity and liberalism. And I want to just, you know, for, for those who don't know, this is really a classic in, in Presbyterian uh, theology and history. Uh, and it was written, I believe the text, it was, uh, the copyright date was 1923, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. And... Um, you know, there's so much going on with the modernist fundamentalist uh, debates at the time, the conflict that was arising and which eventually gave rise to uh, the formation of Westminster Theological Seminary in 1929, coming out of Princeton, uh, and then the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1936. Uh, but understanding Christianity and liberalism, not only what's in it in terms of its content, uh, but also the, the historic context of the book, uh, provides a, a really helpful shortcut and a way for understanding so much of 20th century uh, American Presbyterianism and really world Presbyterianism and in in some ways just Protestant thought and Catholic thought. Uh, I you know I've done some study in in Roman Catholicism in 1910 they had an anti-modernist oath and there there was serious uh, waves uh, that were that were coming through all forms of the Christian Church and all quarters of it. It was a great challenge, and it led to a lot of conflict and a lot of theological disruption. And so we wanted to take the opportunity today, since this new edition exists, just to use as as an excuse to revisit the subject and talk about this history once again and kind of rehearse some of these lessons, because the better we know them today, uh, the better you know, we'll be able to meet the, the next wave of challenges that comes in the church. Uh, Daryl, when were you introduced to this book? Uh, do you recall when you first picked it up and read it? Well, if if your cameras could pick this, I actually purchased this copy of the book for a dollar wow. in the used bookstore at Westminster, but didn't read it until um, well, I was at Harvard Divinity School after studying at Westminster, and I took a course my first semester there with William R. Hutchison, the pro- great historian of modernism and Protestant liberalism who devotes at least a half a chapter in his book on Protestant modernism to Machen in covering the objections to modernism. Um, And so for that course, we read Machen. And that was when I first discovered that this was sort of interesting. I had already done a degree at Westminster, so it felt a little odd that I hadn't read Machen at Westminster. The explanation then was that and I think this is true. When Westminster started in 1936, most people would have already read Christianity and liberalism before going there because that was just sort of what – that was the self-selecting study sure. list for, for students. But by mm-hmm. the time I was going to seminary, I, I had read Francis Schaeffer, but I hadn't really even heard much of, of Machen except that Schaeffer referred to him. So that was the first time I read it, and I did a reading course on the old Princeton theology with Hutchison, and um, I heard, received a lot of encouragement from a number of uh, other historians to do a, a dissertation on Machen, which yeah. I did at Johns Hopkins. True. Johns Hopkins, everyone. <laughs> <Just> yes. 
<laughs> John's was a family name given to the boy. At, and just as we have that happens where you get, get a family name as your first name. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to list them all, but um, I have my, my set of, you know, Machen inspired and Machen related titles here on, on camera, camera two, you guys don't see that camera, but you'll, it'll be in the, in the exported version <laughs> and a lot of Daryl's books, uh, many of which he, he also edited Machen's shorter writings, uh, but then also a, a kind of a, a biography an intellectual biography history of Machen and Barry Waz also edited, um, Letters from the Front, which were letters that Machen wrote from World War One in the field when he served in the uh, the YMCA, correct? As he was right, right. Uh, serving over there, there's tremendous history, and it's it's wonderful to to read about him. And of course, he was instrumental in some would say the founder of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Perhaps that title is inappropriate to talk about founders of churches not being the Messiah himself, but. Um, Nonetheless, he was instrumental in the founding of our denomination. It wouldn't exist, humanly speaking, apart from his instrumentality. And, uh, of course, the founder of Westminster Theological Seminary. So, Daryl, um, maybe you can provide a thumbnail sketch for, for folks who are not up to speed with OPC mythology. <laughs> <laughs> and we mean mythology, I, I say that jokingly, but, you know, this is a, a founding narrative. So it, it's true, right. history. And, right. and right. But we rehearse it because retelling the story also provides, you know, kind of a context and an understanding of who we are in the present day. But for those who might not be familiar with some of uh, the modernist fundamentalist debates, I mean, I'm wondering if you could provide for us a, a thumbnail sketch before we get into those, in, you know, years in the in the 20s per se, and the specifics of this book. Right. Well, let me just say briefly that that point about narratives I've been thinking about of late, partly because there's so much discussion in America about nationalism, the founding. And whether in the New York Times 1619 project now with slavery and yeah and narratives really matter and 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 what's striking to me thinking about differences between the OPC and the PCA for instance or even the URC those denominations or or federations um, don't have the narrative that the OPC does that doesn't mean the OPC is better we just have a much clearer narrative than those other communions do and right. it's easier for us to talk about our founding and actually take some encouragement from it. Not to it's say a powerful that Machen, thing. Mm -hmm. Machen hasn't taken hits of late from some of the woke people out there. He has, but still when you look at the issues involved in the twenties and thirties. So anyway, I'll, I'll try to answer your question. So um, the mod the fundamentalist controversy per se uh, goes on, in my understanding, at two levels. There's a denominational level and there's the national level. The national level, we don't need to talk about a whole lot because it involves the fundamental, excuse me, the Scopes trial and William Jennings Bryan in Dayton, Tennessee, and the prosecution against John T. Scopes for teaching evolution contrary to Tennessee state law. Now, of course, that story in some ways also involves Presbyterian, the Presbyterian controversy, because William Jennings Bryan was an elder in the Presbyterian church, and he actually asked Machen to testify at the Scopes trial, which Machen declined, uh, said he wasn't an expert in Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, which he wasn't, and it, but it was kind of a dodge, because I don't think he really wanted to testify there at that, at that trial. Um, I think he knew it wasn't going to turn out well. So, so it's, it's, it's not as if you can keep these two things distinct, but in Presbyterian circles, and I, 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 I hope we go back to the origins of the book, but in Presbyterian circles, the, the controversy started really in 1922 when Harry Emerson Fosdick fired the first shot. He, he preached a sermon at First Presbyterian Church. I think it was first. Hmm. He made it, um, shall the fundamentalist win mm -hmm. he sort of said these fundamentalists were bad christians for trying to exclude other people from the church uh he he highlighted the ideas of inerrancy but also premillennial dispensationalism um and from there then presbyterians began to respond to a modernist preaching in a presbyterian church fosdick was one of the leading modernists of the era one of the most popular preachers of the era 
He was also a Baptist. So there was a, a real anomaly of a Baptist preaching in a Presbyterian church. So there are any number of issues that Presbyterians could raise objections to. And so conservatives in the Presbyterian of New York raised objections. Clarence McCartney, who was a prominent conservative in Philadelphia, also uh, issued a statement against uh, Fosdick. And from there, you had a series of skirmishes at the local Presbytery level that reached up to the, gen the national level with the General Assembly back and forth in 1923, 24, 25, with great hopes put in who would become the moderator of the General Assembly. Uh, conservatives won that, that um, vote in 1924 with Clarence McCartney becoming moderator. But this was a church too that had a big bureaucratic machinery and it was, would be hard for someone just in office and their moderators did actually stay in office the whole year. It wasn't just for the duration of the assembly to change the church. So M McCartney didn't do much. 1925, though, was the real turning point, at least as it relates to Machen and confessional Presbyterianism. Clarence, Mc uh, no, not Clarence McCartney, Charles Erdman, a mm -hmm. colleague of Machen at Princeton, was the moderator. There had been a series of resolutions to affirm the virgin birth and four other doctrines like the atonement as essential doctrines for the for the church necessary and essential doctrines which goes all the way back to the language of subscription in the adopting act of 1729 it's a peculiar wrinkle in american presbyterian history and we don't need to get into the weeds but still it was possible for the church to affirm necessary and essential articles of faith. The church was ready to reaffirm that in 1925. Again, liberals in New York who had ordained two men who would not affirm, it wasn't that they denied the virgin birth, but they would not affirm the virgin birth. Liberals were worried. They thought they might have to leave the church. In, instead, Erdman's, Erdman appoints a committee. This is different it's a different Erdman. There's only one E in Charles Erdman as opposed to the publisher, right. which is two E's. Mm -hmm. um, he, he appoints a committee, special committee to investigate. And that leads eventually to, in my estimation, a whitewashing of the controversy in the church, pretty much blaming conservatives for making becoming too uh, belligerent, which then leads to another uh, committee to investigate the controversy at Princeton because Erdman's was a faculty. Erdman, sorry, was a faculty member. Machen was a faculty member. People thought something was going on at Princeton, and something was going on at Princeton. Although I think it still remained fairly civil on campus, and that led to a report to to that recommended um, administrative changes to the structures of governance at Princeton Seminary in 1929, which basically meant. The, the board of trusts, the board of directors, which was responsible for the theological content, for the faculty content of the seminary's program, was now, it had been majority conservative board of directors. It became now minority conservative board of directors. And it was at that point that Machen um, decided with other conservatives to found Princeton Seminary. <laughs> Sorry. Westminster yeah. Seminary in mm -hmm. 1929 in Philadelphia. And then you had a, a bit of an interlude. Conservatives, I the way I read it, didn't know what to do because they had lost. They had, I mean, they, they started a seminary, but, you know, it's sort of like starting a seminary in the, in, I don't know what the equivalent would be, say a new seminary in the CRC or something. What would you yeah. do? What in you the do Great Depression as, too. I mean. Right. What, but what do you do as outsiders to try right. to, minister in a church that you think has basically gone liberal. Mm -hmm. And then in 1932, a report on for Protestant foreign missions comes out called Rethinking Missions, which really questions whether missionaries should be uh, involved in preaching the gospel to save people from going to hell. And it advocates a much more humanitarian posture for Protestant foreign missions. Machen uh, opposes that, gets into a series of struggles for that. He's eventually brought to trial in 1935 for, um, again, being belligerent and being a fighter uh, for questioning uh, his peers in the faith, for not showing loyalty to the church, uh, even the charge of uh, lying, breaking the Ninth Commandment for lying about fellow ministers 
and that leads to an appeal of to overturn his conviction by the Presbytery of New Brunswick in 1935. It's appealed to the General Assembly of 1936. The Assembly upholds that appeal. I mean, upholds the verdict of the of the Presbytery. So Machen then starts the uh, with other conservatives again starts the Orthodox Presbyterian Church June 11th, 1936. The 14th birth date birthday of my father who was born on june 11th too so. i don't know if i knew that yeah that's tremendous you know there's so much uh there's so many things you, we can we can dive into and of course the opc particularly has quite a few resources to go into all the different details and there are also some books available from the committee on christian education as well as the committee for the historian uh where we encourage people to, to check those out if you go to opc org uh you can find a link to uh publications and um you you can you can find especially uh daryl's book with john meather uh, fighting the good fight which i'd recommend that and you can also find a book that machen wrote although his name's not on it uh, called the presbyterian conflict right and there's a really you know, daryl's laughing because there's a re- we, we talked to jim scott <laughs> before he has a two-part uh article or two two essay two articles in the Westminster Theological Journal, at least laying out the detective case that Edwin Ryan perhaps I'll just say it, perhaps stole a manuscript that Machen had been working on and maybe finished it and then published it as a book with his name on it. So you know, Jim Scott wrote it. I'm just saying I'm just saying what Jim Scott put in, in the article, but I found the case rather compelling. And can I put you meticulous. on the record? Oh, it's meticulous. It's tremendous. The right. articles. Uh can I put you on the spot and ask you what you what you think about that that story? Are you convinced? I wouldn't say I'm convinced, but mm-hmm. I, I mean I It's compelling at least. So, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, no. Yeah. So if I were on the jury, but I I, I think also the way I've read the history and I remember when I was doing research, coming across a manuscript uh, in the archives, and I, and I wondered about it, I wondered what had happened to it, and I never really followed up to compare it to anything. So, um, so I, I think you know, I mean, Jim obviously has a bias, as every single person does, you know, and and I think he tried to argue against his own bias to keep it in check. So I think he tries mm-hmm. to make a plausible case, not just so the OPC comes out on top somehow. No, sure. I don't think this is really an OPC project necessarily, but, um, it becomes convenient because Edwin Ryan, uh, again, I, I apologize to anyone. If I've offended anyone, I don't mean to speak ill of somebody who is deceased and unable to defend himself, but Jim, Jim Scott at the same time has, has laid out many facts and history that, that, indicate that this might have been the case. And it, apparently at the time, it was also well-known Machen was working on a history right. of right. the Presbyterian conflict, and Edwin Ryan had access to his study, and I believe was the first person to enter the study after Machen had died. And so <laughs> these are all you know, verifiable facts to one degree or another. And so no one's found the manuscript, <laughs> so it, it, it went somewhere. <laughs> but uh, the issue why why this might be con- a convenient thing for the OPC to do or somebody in the OPC to do is that Ryan eventually went back to the Presbyterian Church USA and became kind of a a, a black sheep uh, or a, a figure to to see he's not he went out from us because he wasn't one of these pilgrim and and he people. and he took a job down in Jim's territory not yeah. in Austin but in San Antonio at Trinity University which mm. was is was a presbyterian affiliated institution he was administrator down there yeah there's i really recommend people dig in and, and read those articles they're fascinating or our previous conversations on them on the program but um you know i there's so much i could i could ask but uh let me ask you this to start daryl um where does christianity and liberalism fall within machen's own bibliography you know, what other books right. did he write? I mean, at, at what was he doing at this time? And um, what did he do in the in the years following relatively or before? Right. Well, in the, the dates are getting a little sketchy in my memory because I don't work with this directly. But if right. I recall correctly, 1921, two years before Christianity and liberalism, uh, the, the origin of Paul's religion comes out which was a series of lectures given at, I think, Union Seminary, Richmond. Um, 
And so he had been working on the, the Paul and the, I mean, you could see the fingerprints of the origin of Paul's religion on, um, <clears throat> on Christianity liberalism. And he draws on some of the material, he even footnotes it at times. But uh, it's a case for seeing Paul's religion as supernatural and the origins of Christianity being supernatural, as opposed to try to explain it naturalistically on natural grounds, which was really very much at the center of the debate between uh, conservatives and modernists in, in the in the 1920s. 1922, um, his Greek grammar, New Testament Greek grammar comes out. And so 1923 is when um, Christian liberalism comes out. Two years later, he publishes What is Faith, uh, which was another uh, sort of, it was another shot in the fundamentalist controversy. Doesn't receive as much attention as it's a really good book, though, about the intellectual components of faith, uh, that it's not, faith isn't simply a feeling or something. So he's arguing against that strain of liberalism um, and trying to defend the the intellectual plausibility and the intellectual bona fides of Christianity. And then at the end of the, that decade, he manages to put together a, a work that he'd been working on since an undergraduate then at seminary. It was, they received BDs back, bachelors of, of divinity back then, the, um, the virgin birth of Christ, which he considered his magnum opus, which was a defense of the biblical account of the virgin birth. Uh, that it wasn't some extraneous insertion into the text to make Jesus into some kind of supernatural figure. Uh, and then in the 30s, a couple of uh, collections of essays, one of them published posthumously came out, uh, but those are based on radio addresses that he was doing on behalf of the seminary. Yeah. Perhaps my favorite essay he wrote is the one on mountain climbing. <laughs> right. It, Which I don't think made it into any of those. It It, it is in the uh, selected... Shorter, shorter writings, writings that right. I was able to edit, but um, that's a great piece. It, it is. really is. Yeah, he's and just for anyone who hasn't read Machen or hasn't had an eye or an ear to to recognize, he's a tremendous writer. I and, right. and I was just lamenting my own writing to to some friends a couple of days ago, and I've got a book coming out. Um, my publisher's going to hate me for this, but I mean, I re- <laughs> I've got a book coming out, and I'm reading the the proofs. And I don't know if you're this way, Daryl, but I mean, uh, you're a tremendous writer too. And I aspire to write uh, like you and me. No, tr- honestly, but I, I read my writing, you know, years after and you're like, oh man, some of these passages I wrote years ago, you're like, man, I wish I could just, I, I honestly said, I wish I could wave a Machen wand over this and just, <laughs> you know, apply his style to it because it's so, it's so good and so clear and succinct. And honestly, we, you know, theologians, especially systematicians, would do well to read more Machen, if for no other reason than just to imbibe his clarity of style and yeah. his economy. Although I was, I was here. I'm, I'm back in Hillsdale now. Briefly, I, I'm on sabbatical, and we're staying at our at our summer cottage in mm-hmm. um, Massachusetts, which uh, need not sound overly pretentious because it is in a Methodist campground. It really is <laughs> a still active Methodist <laughs> campground, and we don't really want to go there, but. Um, I, I was here for a pre-semester conference about the classics, and Machen was trained as a classicist, mm. and he he grew up learning Latin and Greek. Uh, he went to Hopkins and 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 majored in the classics, did a did a master's degree in Greek, and I think it's another case for the importance of the classics. I mean, I, and this is where my my education was misspent, and uh, and if I had to do it all over again, I I think I. Right go back and be a classics major. But well, you know, I I I did not receive a classical education either. When I was growing up, the classics were Pac-Man, I think it was <laughs> or Coke, Coca-Cola classic. Like that's what you thought of. You know, the 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 true literary classics are nowhere uh, to be seen or heard. Uh nevertheless, we can we can learn a lot there. Jim, are you still with us? I'm wondering what your experience is with uh, with Machen and Christianity and liberalism. Do you remember the first time you read it? Yeah, I I do, Camden. It was my first year at seminary at Westminster. I was uh, still a pretty young convert, and I was even uh, newer to the Reformed faith, and so I was still kind of learning my way, um, uh, coming out of evangelicalism, and and Machen, of course, brought me a long way um, towards 
coming to the Reformed faith because so much of what he was saying about um, the arguments and the tropes that you might find in modernism, liberalism, uh, I was hearing as an evangelical, uh, which, which was surprising to me because they were, in my mind anyway, the conservative Christians that were out there. They were mm-hmm. pro-life and whatnot, and, uh, and yet much of their theology sounded an awful lot like what uh, Machen was saying about the theology of liberalism. Uh, so that was, uh, that was remarkable to me and will always stand out uh, in my mind also is clarity. But uh, if I can um, make one other statement about the book, mm-hmm. and, and maybe uh, Daryl can, can uh, field, maybe it's a question or a comment, I don't know, but we'll see what else comes out. Um, so when, uh, when Machen wrote the book, one of the things that struck me about it is that uh, you know, it's, it's happening during the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And when we hear the word fundamentalist, which Machen was... Um, he was dubbed a, 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 a fundamentalist, and he was taking the fundamentalist side in the controversy. Oftentimes we think of sort of, you know, a kind of a, a, a lack of, of integrity and scholarship, a sort of a, um, a hackneyed approach to uh, polemics and apologetics. And Machen did not uh, ring that way when I, when I read this book. In fact, uh, um, he was quite uh, even-handed in my mind. He was balanced. He had integrity. He went um, uh, to original sources. He was he was treating uh, liberals as, with with respect. And so that was something that that jumped out at me when I read the book. And I don't know if Daryl's got any uh, comments or thoughts about sort of the way in which he intellectually, honestly. Um, engaged with uh, the writings and the thought of actual liberals and how that was received among liberals. Yeah. Uh, it w- I would say at the end, it wasn't necessarily received that well, that well, although I think any most serious liberals took Machen's arguments seriously because he was not engaged in mere polemics. He was engaged in polemics, but he was trying to do something that was serious and trying to take the other person's point of view into perspective as much as possible. Um, And I think how I came to Machen through that course at Harvard Div School with William R. Hutchison, I think he recognized that Machen was actually doing something unusual for fundamentalists. the other part of that, though, I, th- I am. Um, there are two kinds of historians. I guess you could argue there are lumpers and splitters. I'm a splitter. Uh, typically, the history of fundamentalism has been written by lumpers, and so you put in everybody who's opposed to liberalism, and you call them fundamentalists, and you don't really see the diversity of views there. Um, and I've tried to rescue something like con- con- confessional Presbyterianism. You know, partly to to uh, rescue Machen from the badge or the label of fundamentalism, which isn't a great thing. But even Machen himself, this is where another point where his uh, life intera- intersected with William Jennings Bryan, who was actually a much more interesting figure, also than the ways even I think the way confessional Presbyterians regard him. But when Bryan died five days after the um, the Scopes trial. Uh, his fans, friends in Dayton started a, a college, Brighton, Bryan Memorial College, and they asked Machen to be the president. Machen declined. And, but in that letter, he said, um, I never call myself a fundamentalist. I call myself a Calvinist. If the choice has to be, if it's only between fundamentalism and modernism, then I am a fundamentalist of the most pronounced stripe. But I prefer to call myself a reformed Christian or Calvinist, not a fundamentalist, because he thought that fundamentalism really was trying to reduce Christianity to something of a bare few points of fundamentals. And that really wasn't the tradition of Princeton, old Princeton, or the tradition of confessional Presbyterianism. Um, And truth be told, the, the word fundamentalism actually started with uh, Southern Baptists in 1922 or so, I think, um, 
it's not Frederick Lee Laws, it's somebody Lee Laws, Curtis Lee Laws, the editor of a Southern Baptist paper, newspaper adopts that term. So it really has Baptist origins. And this actually points also to the, the Fosdick, the importance of the Fosdick sermon. He was preaching as a Baptist and he had Baptists, I think, on his mind when he was preaching that. He was pushing back against the fundamentalist Baptists and he didn't seem to think that this could actually set something off among Presbyterians, which it wound up doing as well. So there's a really, I hate the word complicated right now. It's way overused. It's a convoluted uh, series of events that are coming together there. But again, oftentimes historians lump it all together as fundamentalism. And I think it's an injustice to any number of the variations that are going on in the 1920s and trying to understand those people uh, in their own times. Would you see some analogs with what we deal with today with the evangelical vote? And you, and you, you have anything, you know, lumped in there from, uh, you know, historic Calvinism all the way to, you know, some version of Christianity that you find in like Netflix series, The Family. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, right. you know, this, this shadow organization, no, apparently, uh, that's uh, trying to run the, the American political scene. Exactly. Uh, and uh, unf- yes, so you can have everyone from Franklin Graham to uh, Paula, Paula White. White. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, you know, even Joel Osteen, although right. he's, he stayed out of the political stuff, but, and I mean, ev- I've been saying this about evangelicalism for a while, so I'm, it's, it's kind of a dead horse, but, um, that, that, that's another word that just become a, a lumping word that doesn't do justice to the variety of, uh, people in something that is a Protestantism outside the main line which is one way of trying to, to think about it. But um, yeah, so, I, and boy, have historians, scholars, uh, journalists ridden that evangelicalism thing hard. Oh, but sure. We don't, need to, we don't need to get into... No, well, that's for Although, another, another I project. mean, I would say, I don't know where you wanted to go uh, with this, but um, the, the specific context of the book is actually the General Assembly of 1920. Machen was a first-time commissioner at the General Assembly, and this was the culmination of, at this General Assembly was the culmination of 50 years of progressive Protestantism, which I would actually say was very much supportive of a Christian nationalism, and they're you know, their shining moment was helping to win World War I, which even though Machen served in the YMCA, he was not in any way sympathetic to the English in that struggle. He had studied in Germany in graduate school, and he was much more sympathetic to, to Germany in some ways, partly because of friendship, partly because he was suspicious of the English or the British Empire. Um, and this is a you know a different Germany from the Germany that emerges in the 30s with Hitler. So let's also try to keep that straight. The Kaiser is not Hitler. Um, so I mean, Machen was standing up. So at at the 20, 1920 General Assembly, there's a proposal for uh, the union of all Protestant churches in the United States, the Organic Union. They had had a federal union in in 1908 with the Federal Council of Churches. Now they wanted to merge into one body. It was a colossal failure. It wasn't, it, but it was plausible because the same thing happened in Canada. And in 1925, similar era, you have the formation of the United Church of Canada, which took Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Methodists and put them into one church. Although it wound up creating four churches because there were Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Methodists who stayed out of the United Church, which would have happened in the United States as well. But Machen saw this coming, and he heard the report. The report was given by the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, J. Ross Stevenson, and I'm sure he was thinking, what on earth is going on here? And so he then gives an address. He meets the General Assembly was at Philadelphia, in Philadelphia. He meets other conservatives in that area. I'm sure he know, knew some from uh, Philadelphia, but then there was also the Presbytery of Chester, which is just south and east, west of Philadelphia. Um, and he gave a talk in 1921 called 
Christianity or Liberalism, I think was called. And that became an essay that was published in the Princeton Theological Review. So the origins of the book actually go back to 1920. He was thinking about yeah. this even before F Fosdick preached his sermon. And he was reacting again to th what's important to see about that that Protestant movement of ecumenism that was going on from the the union, the reunion of the old school and new school Presbyterians in 1869. And Presbyterians were prominent in this Protestant ecumenical endeavor. It was also very much a social gospel endeavor. These people wanted to Christianize America. And for all the flack that Machen's taking of late for his, his, his clear um, error if you want to call it sin, about race. He saw, though, that these people were also guilty of a kind of white Christian nationalism. And he was opposed to using the church in that way. It, and and that's that's part of where his this book comes from. He's he does talk exclude well, not exclusively, a lot about theology in the book, but he also talks about society and politics a number of times. And he's very um, critical of the social gospel movement. He doesn't call it that directly, but he talks about using Christianity to, to solve certain social problems. And he's very critical of that, especially I think it's in chapter six or so, the chapter on the church. Um, yeah. So I think Machen, I mean, and he wasn't the lone one doing this. I've done a lot of work on H.L. Mencken. Mencken also saw this progressivism and opposed it. He was not a fan of, of where the United States went in World War I. And there were other kind of constitutional libertarian types who were opposed to these developments, both in the church and in the nation. Um, so, but I don't think I rec I don't think I recognized as much what Machen was up to in the book when I, when I wrote my dissertation. Um, and I'll, you know, I don't know what, I can't remember what you do for show notes um, and I'll try to send you a link and sure. if you want to put it up there, but that'd be great. Michael, Michael Doran or Duran. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He's a, he's a foreign policy guy. He worked in the Bush administration and now I'm not sure what think tank he works for, but he published a piece in first things about two years ago about American foreign policy, but he was writing favorably about William Jennings, Bryan and sort of contrasting the liberal Protestant, uh, understandings of America's role in the world versus the fundamentalist one. And, and there, I think Machen would fit in, in Duran's analysis. And so there was more going on than simply a controversy in the church over the virgin birth of Christ. It was also, these were mainline churches. These were important American institutions and they were supporting a nationalist vision in many respects. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the substance of the book, because yeah. we've sort of been talking about the historical content, which is really important, excellent stuff. Uh, but also just, you know, it seems to me that maybe uh, diving into uh, the argument of the book, and I know that it's got their various aspects of it, but um, uh, Daryl, could you take us a little bit into the line of argumentation that Machen is uh, is making and uh, why he's making it that way? And I don't know, just maybe talk about the the substance and of the theology and the and the argumentation of the book. Right. Well, it's it's a fairly simple, fairly simple argument, and and that goes to the clarity of Machen's thought. He didn't. He didn't gum it up and try to make it convoluted and try to make it. All, I mean, I think it's it's subtle in aspects, but it's still also still very straightforward, which is make, why I think the book is easy to read. Um, so he, he basically notes in the introduction that the modern world has changed dramatically from the way the world was when Christianity started. So how is it possible, especially in an age of science, to hold on to these old beliefs that, that Christianity maintains, um, especially supernatural be beliefs based on supernatural realities? And he, he then says that liberalism is a response to that. Liberalism is trying to adapt Christianity to these modern realities. And so what Christianity what liberals try to do is to take the essence of Christianity and these abstractions about the love of God, 
the brotherhood of man, etc. These are somehow the essence of Christianity. And w these other beliefs about Jesus as virgin born or as uh, rising from the dead or things like that, we don't really need those. Those are, those are just externalities to Christianity. And then Machen's going to walk through the book under doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of uh, Christ, doctrine of the church, doctrine of salvation, and, and show how you can have Christianity without these things that liberals think are external to the faith, that actually Christianity is bound up with these things. So that leads you him to conclude or to argue throughout that liberalism really is a different religion, that these, these broad humanitarian kinds of ideals that liberals espouse, they sound good, they try to link them to Christianity in some way, but they're not Christianity. So that's why it's a different, different religion. That in broad strokes, I think, is is the substance of the book. But it's it's a very doctrinal book in the sense that he walks through, in, in effect, the major low C, low chi, low key of uh, however you say it, of, <laughs> uh, of systematic theology. <clears throat> Absolutely, you know that emphasis on the historic uh, nature of um, of the Christian message is is replete throughout the entire book. But it's not just the fact that it is historic in one sense, but also that 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 the work of Christ, you know, continues to be evident and applicable uh, in history now. So it's 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 uh, of course it matters what happened two thousand years ago, but it, it's also we're connected to it ultimately through our through the work of the Holy Spirit and and Him applying the the death and resurrection of Christ unto us. I was just reading it again today, and especially the chapter on doctrine. He has a whole chapter. Every chapter is really a chapter on doctrine, but there's one specifically titled uh, a chapter on doctrine, and it's tremendous. Um, it really is, uh, and I'd encourage everyone to read it uh, to to just be reminded about these things. Um, did this book, Daryl, serve? Um, I got a couple questions uh, on this point. One, I'm interested to see if it had an influence outside of Presbyterian circles, because, uh, of course, as I mentioned, that you know, modernism was something that affected everything, affected the whole world, not just even Christianity, affected art, uh, and 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 in every cultural aspect of the world, it it touched in one way, shape, or form. Uh, but you know, so my question, in one sense, is: Did Machen have an effect outside of traditional Reformed and Presbyterian circles? But then also within uh, the the Presbyterian circles, particularly, did this book serve as kind of a a magnet, you know, for like minded people, or or somewhere you could hang your hat, or somewhere you could identify, you know, in the in the current Presbyterian environment, uh, especially like within with our brothers and sisters over in the PCA, you know, there tends to be a desire to have networks that of like minded people within the denomination that might assist in affecting change. And frankly, I don't know if that was such a thing, uh, you know, in the, in the twenties and then in the thirties. Uh, and even if it was or wasn't a thing, did this book kind of function in a way of helping people to, to find like-minded right. brothers and sisters and fighters in the faith? Well, the book became, um, very popular, and it wasn't through uh, Machen's own doing, or the or the um, or the uh, the plausibility of his of his argument, or the giftedness of his writing. Um, he was preaching uh, at Nassau Street Presbyterian Church in Princeton during the winter of 1922, I think, maybe 23. Um, and he was preaching with the, the controversy in view. One of the pew holders in the church was, um, uh, what's his first name? Henry Van Dyke, uh, who was an English literature professor at Princeton, who was the ambassador of the United States to the Netherlands during the Wilson administration. He was also very friendly with the Machins. Uh, in Machins' correspond correspondence with his family, he would refer to Van Dyke as Uncle Henry. So I don't know where those connections came from. Machen was in those kind of muckety-muck circles. 
um, which is another <laughs> reason why it, it took a lot of courage for him to, um, to, you know, to, to go against these people. Um, but Van Dyke did not like the, what, what Machen was preaching. So he called a press conference as you could as something of a political figure to, to resign his pew at the church and he, he, he did it because of Machen's preaching. And Machen said in one letter that, um, so this must have been in 23, that th the reporters were thick as flies at his dorm room door because he still lived in the dorm as a single man. And also he said that his sales of his book spiked from like a thousand a year to 4,000. <laughs> so all of a sudden Machen, Machen was on the radar of the media such as it was then and from then on he's he is regularly asked to speak right to represent the fundamentalist perspective and in fact during the scopes trial itself the new york times ran wanted to run a series what does evolution stand for now what is what does fundamentalism stand for now machen didn't write under the title of what does fundamentalism stand for now? I think he wrote under what does Christianity stand for? It could have been what does fundamentalism stand for now. But he he was the one that they found to contribute to that series, which was in the, and he doesn't address evolution at all in that in that essay for the Times. But that's just one example of ways in which he was repeatedly asked to speak or write to represent that. So, you know, Machen was in sort of the right time at the right place. Yeah. And that, then he became a figure. And uh, I mean, Princeton itself became a kind of network. So also as Machen became popular, uh, enrollments increased at the seminary, which is one of the reasons why some people didn't like Machen because they thought that they were bringing in the wrong kind of students. Oh, sure. The wrong kind of students being graduates of Bible colleges and not graduates of Presbyterian colleges. So Princeton was in some ways the network. Westminster also became a network, although Machen in the 30s, he and other conservatives founded something like the Presbyterian Constitutional Covenant Union or Covenant Constitutional Union. It's a PCCU, which basically was an organization set up. And the, and the PCA also did something like this, that if we lose certain votes, then this is ready to go to start the new denomination. So there were those kinds of networks. The other part of your question about international influence. Um, or inter-ecclesiastical influence, ecumenical, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, th Korea, there, was, there were people who were uh, following Machen, cons conservatives in the Korean Presbyterian Church, who sort of used Machen as the model for what they were trying to do to oppose liberalism as they understood it. In their communion, of course, it gets really uh, hard sometimes to see exact parallels between what's going on in the United States and Korea, and they may have missed some of the message. And, and you know, you can't draw the lines clearly, but still, that was an inspiration in Korea. Also, in Northern Ireland, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, I think, is what they're still called, um, and there's still a small communion in in Northern Ireland. And they started with a controversy very similar to what Machen was undergoing. And Machen, in fact, was in Ireland at the time of a trial that was going on in, in the Presbyterian Church of Ireland. And, and there were great affinities and great um, admiration of Machen among um, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. So those are two examples. He also had influence on Canadians. You could even argue that the resistance of Presbyterians in Canada to the the, um, the United Church of Canada, that 1925 body formed, drew some inspiration from Machen. They invited Machen to be the, the, um, the president, in effect, uh, of the Knox Theological College, which was their seminary in Canada. So he, he had, I think, especially in the English-speaking world, Machen was a, uh, a known quantity. I don't know as much, say, about German speaking protestantism uh to say that you know in in researching machen no doubt you've read many if not all of his available letters i suspect how did he deal with that with that pressure and that being thrust into the the public eye in a way was it something he struggled with 
Well, I still remember one letter he wrote to his mother um, around 1930 or so when I think he said something to the effect like, I wish I could retire from these controversies and just sit back and write big, fat, thick books. Um, and climb mountains. So, I, yeah, I think, it, I think it did weigh on him. He was a man of means, at least family money. So he, when he had time, for leisure, he could go to places like Switzerland and climb mountains. Um, you know, so we don't need to feel incredibly sorry for him. He he found ways, outlets, but he still, I mean, he because he didn't have a family. I mean, he, he as a bachelor, he had in some ways more time on his hands to devote to these things. Um, and every almost every single student who studied at Princeton or Westminster, especially Princeton, because I think at Westminster, it became too much for him to interact with students the way he wanted to. But everyone spoke very affectionately of him, even those who might have been liberal, who disagreed with him, uh, spoke of him being accessible. Of course, he was living in the dorm. Um, but, you know, somehow he managed to juggle a lot of balls. But you know, you know, I mean, I think temperamentally, was he a fighter? Uh, I mean, the Machins and the Gresham's as Southerners had probably some fight in them. Um, his brother, Arthur, his older brother, um, was uh, ran for Congress in 1926 on the anti-prohibition ticket in Baltimore. Um, not successfully. You know, so, I mean, he may have gotten some of this honestly, but his younger brother was an architect and wasn't really involved in such things. Um, so people have tried to attribute the book, his, his, his involvement in the controversies to his temperament. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's hard to do psychological stuff from afar. Precisely. And it's hard also to think that, wait, this is somehow bizarre. I don't, I don't understand why people would necessarily see this as bizarre, but then I'm also a person who's drawn to being provocative or to people who are provocative, to people who think outside the box, who yeah. aren't drawn to the party line. And Machen was not drawn to the party line. See, I don't, and, I don't yeah, interpret ahead. Machen, uh, you know, I, I struggle with people that would see Machen as kind of a provocateur. I don't read him that way at all. And I, I, I mean, in my brief time in the Reformed Church and specifically within the OPC, I've been a member for only 12 years. I grew up in the mainline Presbyterian Church, but a conservative one at that. But I've, I've come increasingly aware of the fact that people don't know, people who are outside of this mindset don't know how properly to interpret a pilgrim. I mean, in the way that Milgram, that, that Machen was a, a a true pilgrim, you know, seeking a better country, and 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 working that out ecclesiastically, and consistently, because I've seen this in other cases too, and encountered people, you know, with various, even opinions of me or friends of mine or Reform Forum or whatever, that don't understand, you know, what what we're shooting for, <laughs> and and misinterpret a pilgrim ethic. And, uh, you know, a, a fighting spirit for the truth in those sense for, you know, belligerency or, you know, some sort of maltemperament or as the Cohen brothers might say or, or Buster Scruggs might say, a misan <laughs> misanthrope, you know. <laughs> so I, I wonder, you know, and maybe we are all misanthropes. But I don't think so. But I think, I think often this pilgrim mentality is misinterpreted. And I, I, I don't find Machen to be a misanthrope at all, but that's just me. But then it would be easy to write my, my opinion off because people would see me perhaps as one of them too. So, Right. Uh, right. I mean, if, if you look at the people who have, who have criticized him on temperamental grounds, um, I do think they have a standard that most people could not measure up to. Yeah. So it makes me think that they basically disapprove of what Machen did, but they don't really have a good argument for it. So they'll use that one. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't mean to belittle those arguments, but um, it, it, I mean, Machen made, as you indicate, 
he, he did not take cheap shots. He really tried. I think he really tried to refrain from taking cheap shots. And one of the criticisms of the book was that he didn't name enough names. But Machen didn't want to prosecute people in the book and call them liberal in the book without actually going through the procedures of, a, of either a trial or, or letting them defend themselves in some way. So he wasn't going to take cheap shots like that. Um, but. Uh, such, I mean, such was the, the conviction. They convicted him in the PCUSA, you know, prior to the, the, it being read. I mean, they, they made up their minds and didn't even afford him necessarily a proper trial. And just viewed him as as uh, someone who needed like a cancer. He needed to get right. they need to get rid of him. I mean, and it and it's it's an odd way of thinking about dissent. I mean, I guess dissent can go too far, and I think we're living at a time where it may be. But if you're a Protestant, how can you ever think that dissenting is yeah. a bad thing? Where would Protestantism be without a Luther, right, a Zwingli, or if you're an American? How could you ever think dissenting is a terrible thing? I mean, you don't have the war for independence and American independence without some kind of dissent. So e either on national grounds or on Protestant grounds, you can still say that there's something valuable to dissent. And then, yeah. you know, then maybe talk about questions of what's going too far. Uh, but that's going to be a hard line to draw. Right. And that's, one reason why, church-wise, we very much appreciate protecting the rights of the minority through parliamentary procedure. As difficult as that may be, and as much as that might try our patience, there is a tremendous reticence, at least in the General Assembly, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, ever to call the question. That's right. just not something right. you do. You do not do that. Why? Because of our narrative. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Lesson learned, anyway. No, I don't mean lesson learned as if I tried to do that. I mean, lesson learned, we learned the lesson from history, which is why we don't do that. Right. Oh, my. Daryl, what would you say, we've perhaps already addressed this question, but what would you hope or desire for new readers of Christianity and liberalism who are reading it in, who knows, this whatever world we're living in now, evangelical-wise, liberal wise truth is whatever you want to make it um you know how how would you want to see christianity and liberalism finding you know a new voice and a new application for people today give money to me to start a machin <laughs> i'm kidding um the machin fund is <laughs> i would like to see people who are not in reformed churches join reform churches, because I think that's what Machen was also trying to do was to defend a reformed church and, um, and save the one he was in. And he was, you know, I mean, I, th I really think it's important that the last chapter is about the church and the importance of the fellowship of the church, the importance of sacraments, the importance of worship. And, and it's another piece of the of the argument that oftentimes people miss um and and he talks in there at the very end about what a blessing it is to go to a congregation where there's real fellowship and there's real bonds around the word and around the table so i think you know aside from joining a reformed church if that's not possible if that's not where someone's convictions are at least becoming serious about uh, in their involvement in the local church and or denomination and or federation, yeah. et cetera, and keeping an eye out on um, the activities of their their minister or their ministers at the, you know, at the den denominational level. I, I think that would be a fair thing uh, that Machen was, was about. And I think that would be a fitting tribute in a way. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's tremendous. I, I can't recommend this book more highly uh, than any book written by human. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's so important. And um, if you haven't read it, then I encourage people to pick up a copy and read it, to study it. Also to study the history. Um, Daryl uh, did, a, did a series on Machen at Calvary OPC years ago that we recorded and uh, still online. I'll try to put a link to that 
in the description as well. But um, perhaps we can do some more things in the future. But in the meantime, of course, Christianity and Liberalism, now the Legacy Edition, <laughs> available <laughs> from uh, Westminster you get a, Seminary Do you get a Press. car with that? Yeah, you should. <laughs> what car would it be? Do you think? <laughs> isn't that? Isn't there a legacy? Isn't there a legacy uh, brand legacy out edition. there or or model? I think there is. I can't. I can't recall now. I think I mean, it might be. I'm uh, not in that league, but I thought there was. I thought I saw sure. an ad once. Anyway, the legacy edition. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're you, you're right. I'm sure there is. Thank you very much uh, to Westminster Seminary Press for sending us a copy of this so we can work through it. And I do encourage people to visit them online at wtsbooks.com. Uh, if you don't have a copy, pick one up. Um, and you can always keep your eyes open to uh, the Reform Forum store. Once in a while, Ryan Noah finds some first and second editions hmm. uh, of the of the book, and they'll they'll pop up, and you know we'll put them up there for a reasonable rate, usually less than you know what you're gonna generally find them from a you know collector or whatnot i don't know how ryan finds this stuff but he finds it so <laughs> and uh i've got a copy myself let's see here oh old one here with dust jacket so you know you can find these old ones uh to reverend arthur wake i don't know if you know him hmm. no I have no idea no. i hope i was kind of hoping you did know him because then i could say my, my copy's worth more from a co-worker in Christ Vineyard, Harvey Brown, Richmond, Virginia, huh. May, May 1st, 1924. And this one. Wow. So this is a 1924. This thing's is second edition. But anyway, right. That's they're out what I there. Have, yeah. They're out there. So uh, of course you can you can uh, visit Hillsdale College online, Hillsdale.edu, a great school. Uh Daryl teaches there. Of course, our, our friend Richard Gamble was on the program recently. He also teaches there. And uh, the church as well, where, where Daryl serves as a ruling elder, uh, you can visit uh, the pastor uh, Everett Hennis, uh, another friend of ours. It's a good group of folks out there, and uh, hope to visit sometime soon. But if you're traveling through uh, Michigan, head on over to uh, to them. Where are you? About the center of the mitten, right in the, right in the middle, kind of, aren't you? Well, at yeah. low center. Well, very low, right. About 18 miles north of um, southern Michigan, sure. The Indiana border, actually. Yeah. It's a good, good place. It's a good country. Anyway, uh, and you can find us online at reformedforum.org. Uh, we encourage you to visit us there and, and, of course, sign up for the conference. We would really like to see you in October. Uh, but we, of course, want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>